EPSC's point of view, we are delighted to see that kind of cross flow between the science, uh, science community and the education and outreach community. So, um, yes, thank you ever so much to the organisers, and I hope that we will in the future be able to do something like this again um, at future meetings. So, um, our first talk this morning is um, Maita Vasquez, who yeah, is going sorry. to talk to us about um, Galileo Mobile interactive astronomy activities in schools. So, hello. Welcome to my talk. Uh, I'm Maita Vasquez, and I'm a current member of uh, the Galileo Mobile uh, project. So, today I'm going to talk about the Galileo Mobile handbook, uh, which is based on astronomy activities that we use at schools uh, when we do expeditions. And I'm going to explain later on what an expedition means. So, what is Galileo Mobile? Maybe, maybe not many of you know what is Galileo Mobile. And this is a, a traveling science education program that brings astronomers closer to young people around the world and mainly across regions that have little or no access to outreach activities related to astronomy. Galileo Mobile is a purely non-profit initiative run by astronomers, educators, and science communicators. So uh, people like me, uh, researchers, uh, we are volunteering, currently volunteering for, to make this project work. So what is our aim? We aim at fostering a will of learning through the exciting wonders of our universe by organi organizing astronomy-related activities in schools and villages. So the schools and villages uh, are located in regions that have almost no access to astronomy programs, as I mentioned before. So during, uh, in order to, to bring astronomy to the schools and villages, uh, we do what we call an expedition. And during the expedition, we perform activity sessions, workshops uh, for teachers, uh, which is related as well to, in connection to uh, the GTTP program. So we, at the end of uh, each workshop, uh, we, we give up certificate from GTTP. And uh, we always take with us as well educational materials, and we give ongoing support to the uh, schools and village uh, after each expedition, so after coming back uh, from each country. So these are the volunteers, our members, current and uh, previous members of the Galileo Mobile Project. We are about 21 uh, current members, and we're all from very different countries. We work on a daily basis. Uh, uh, during, well, usually our free time or time that we don't really have to dedicate to this project and to make it, to make it work. So we have different tasks uh, to complete to make each expedition work and also to have our handbook complete. So we have done already several expeditions. The first one took place uh, back in 2009 in the Andes. Uh, this, is, this was actually the name of the expedition, and it took place in Peru, Bolivia, and Chile, in the Andes region. And uh, during this year, this was the year, I don't know if you remember, uh, the International Year of Astronomy, and we were designated uh, by it as a, a special project of 2009. Then we traveled as well in 2012 to Bolivia. This was a pilot expedition, so only one of our members uh, actually got to travel to the, the Amazons uh, region in Bolivia. And this was just uh, as a preparation for an extended version of the expedition. And uh, in 2012, we also traveled to India. This was the Kaggle Graph expedition. I'm sorry, India is here. And we traveled to uh, the south of India, the Karnataka state, between Bangalore and Mysore. In 2013, we also visited uh, Africa, so Uganda. And very recently, so I just came back about three weeks ago, we visited the Amazons between Bolivia and Brazil. And this was called the Bravo Expedition. So I continue. So from each expedition, the most important uh, part is the 
are the activities that we perform with students. This is how we get to inspire them and we also get closer to them, learn from their, from their cultures as well, many different cultures um, from each country. So here you can, you are able to see uh, the solar system, for example, here we have uh, an activity uh, while performing a spectroscopy. And this activity here took place in the Amazons uh, in Bolivia this year with visually impaired students. So we are um, performing visually, um, activities for visually impaired students now as well with the help of a touch of the universe. So this is our current, our new version of the handbook. This is, uh, you can download it for free. It's completely available in our, on our website and it's called Under the Same Sky. This is actually part of our motto. Uh, when we travel to each school uh, or village that we visit, it's very important for us uh, that the students and teachers keep in mind that we are all on the same sky because me as an astronomer, for example, what I observe away from Earth is a planet and there are no boundaries uh, between the territories in the planet. So is, this is very important for us and this is our motivation in Galileo Mobile. So this uh, handbook is, um, it works to support our activities and, and teacher workshops. Uh, we also uh, bring a version, print out version of the handbook with us to, and we donate it to the school. And this also helps to encourage uh, the teachers that we visit to follow up, uh, to keep continue with follow up activities after we leave the, the, the expeditions. And this is of course a free resource as I mentioned uh, that you can share and anyone can share around, around the world with other schools. So our handbook of activities, uh, you may wonder how, how it, it was started. Uh, well, uh, we received uh, continuous uh, support from uh, UNAWIN and also the GTT program. And of course, there, there's been also other institutions or organizations that they've been involved in the uh, making of, the, of our handbook. So our handbook uh, has been adapted from different activities uh, were presented by these organizations. So our handbook, uh, before it was made, um, each activity has uh, was done in order to uh, to to have these three criteria. So the first one is that each activity has to be very interactive. So we all learn together under the same sky. This helps us to to communicate and um, give information and also discuss about different, different thoughts on the, on the concepts that we want to explain through the activities. Then we have that the activities also have to be very practical. So this uh, means that the students have to learn by doing. No memorization is needed. Then. All the activities, uh, because they are very interactive, we used uh, materials uh, to explain to the students the different concepts, and all of those have to be very low cost so that it can be doable anywhere in the world because we usually visit uh, countries uh, that might be undeveloped or that they don't have access to some sort of um, materials to perform the activities, and we try to to keep it as simple as possible. So this is our table of contents. Um, as you can see, we have uh, different activities. Uh, for example, the stars and constellations, the solar system. So they cover different topics in astronomy. Uh, the sun, the planets, beyond the solar system, and light and optics. And besides this, um, this table of contents, uh, we are um, actually performing now the activities for visually impaired students. So that's being added as well to the handbook of activities. So the handbook is made to attract the teacher to curiosity with a problem, a puzzling, for, to a specific situation in related to astronomy. 
This uh, is an example of a small classroom experiment uh, by, uh, by using images, data, and movies. So then the students or, or groups formulate from this a hypothesis, predictions, and make questions about it. The students or, or, or groups also plan and conduct an experiment or build a model to confront the, the problem with observations. And then we have that the students draw conclusions, draw their own conclusions based on the evidence, so what they've been um, testing already. And the student discuss their measurement a strategy, compare their solutions, and consider alternative explanations. This is at the end of each activity. And this is, uh, these are the main steps that we follow for the students to learn the concepts uh, we want them to keep from astronomy. Then this is uh, an example of one of our activities. This is uh, the Earth's orbit. So here the student, the main uh, purpose is, is that the student investigate the following question. What is the shape of the path that Earth follows around the sun? So we, of course, start by explaining certain concepts uh, related to the orbit of Earth so that we don't start from zero. <laughs> And then we pass to images based on satellite, uh, satellite images uh, taken from the sun. And each activity at the beginning, so on the first page, uh, you will always find information on the age. Uh, our activities can, can be used from age um, five or, or six till very well. We have performed activities with even university students. So. Uh, then you have the duration as well for each activity, meth uh, method category. For example, in this, uh, in this case, it's inquiry-based. And of course, the materials that need to be used. Uh, in this case, um, yeah, it is required to print out uh, copies of uh, the images of the sum. And maybe a ruler, calculator, and optional. We also give some optional materials in case that are not available. And we also present a, a diagram of, in order to explain the concept we, wa we would like to, to the student to, to keep. So then these are, for example, an example of the images we, we present to the students. And sometimes it's funny because uh, they don't realize at the beginning this is uh, the sum. And then they, they start by measuring something because this is all the information we give. How can we, how do we know that the Earth is not moving around in a perfect circle around the Earth, I mean around the sun, and now not an, an ellipse, for example? Why, or why is the opposite, or why, why how should it be the opposite to that? And then they, they start sometimes by measuring the, uh, the sunspots, but they realize um, that it's no, uh, it doesn't follow a logic uh, in terms of the images we are presenting. We are presenting about four images taken in wi during winter, uh, spring, summer, and, and fall time. And then they realize they have to measure, of course, the uh, circumference of, of the sun to see how, and this is how they realize uh, when it's, that it's changing uh, somehow. So when it's uh, closer to us or when it's farther. So somehow we take them uh, to, the, to the final result that it is to, to know that the, the Earth is now moving in a perfect circle around the sun. And this is, of course, uh, done very interactively. And uh, they can get as well to calculate uh, uh, the leaps of, the, of our solar system of the Earth around the sun. So I continue. The, we also have uh, the Earth as a paper core, and this is to, in order to understand distances between planets um, and how how large are the planets uh, compared to others. And this is really nice because uh, you can do this as well with uh, from age eight. Um, I try with uh, very small students as well, and from age six, and it worked as well. Uh, it gives as well the, well, as you can see, this is uh, the first page of the, of the activity. You can find the materials. In this case, you can use uh, clay, Play-Doh, 
or aluminum foil, so what is best uh, to use. But uh, I'm pretty sure there are other materials as well that can be used uh, and they're cheaper. Uh, or yeah, we also propose uh, seeds uh, like pink head, peppercorns, sesame seeds, uh, in order to represent the planets in case uh, these other materials are not available. And the point of this uh, activity is to make the student think, okay, what if uh, I would like to understand distances between the planet, what, what would, would we do? I mean, how, how to start? And usually they propose to make it smaller, but then, okay, we have the problem that the rest of the planets are very large, what do we do? And they bring all the planets uh, to a scale, but then they realize that the scale is not perfect. Uh, sometimes the Jupiter is not so large compared to, to Earth or, uh, sorry. So we continue with this uh, model worksheet once they have constructed planets. And in this case, for example, we, I give them a, a special and a specific number for the Earth, which is two millimeters. And from there, they know that they have to make the planet somehow adjust the system to having this information that our Earth is now two millimeters. And after some time of discussing, of course, there is, um, they, they do calculations in order to have the rest of the, of the planet scale. This, of course, as well as the previous activity, they, it takes some time for them. This is uh, one probably negative point of, about the doing in a more interactive way is that it takes is time consuming. So you need to give time to the students for them to realize, uh, um, ask questions, discuss between themselves, and of course reach uh, to the final result because it's now so uh, intuitively uh, from the beginning. So, so about the, the handbook, uh, you can share it. It's for free, as I said. Uh, this one is in Spanish and English. Portuguese and in Hindi as well. So if you want to translate it, um, you can just contact us. It's, uh, that would be a nice uh, help. And thank you for your attention. This is our email address. Uh, we are on Facebook, Twitter, <laughs> Pinterest, anywhere <laughs> where you can find. Um, you can find pictures from the new expedition as well um, on Facebook if you have, uh, if you have any account. So thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have one quick question? So just wondering, how do you define the destination of the Gallo expeditions? I mean, they're generally started in Southern America, but uh, what about other places? What is the uh, criteria to select these locations? Uh, well, we start by discussing <laughs> between the members, discussion between the members, and uh, we pick the places in terms of uh, support that we, um, pro po some possible support that we, we may receive from, from these uh, this countries or institutions that we know that they can support us and they can continue with follow-up uh, activities in there. Because uh, once we come back, I mean, we don't go back every, every year to each country. And it's very important that uh, we leave uh, a little grain uh, because uh, this is how, yeah, for example, in the case of India, uh, the Institute of Astrophysics of India didn't have an outreach program. And they just started an outreach program after, so after Galileo Mobile visited the country. So they can continue now with the activities uh, in there. So it's based, mainly based on that. And something I, I forgot to, to mention is that we have also done um, individual activities. So I, I've, I've done individual activities in uh, the Dominican Republic. Uh, some others uh, have gone to Haiti, Guatemala, and also Nepal. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so our next speaker is Andrea Longobardo, um, who is going to tell us about uh, FameLab um, and talking about planetary science in three minutes. You've got a bit longer than three minutes, so. Uh, uh -huh. No, the presentation is longer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Where is it? 
Forks, ne? Okay, good morning. I am going to present what I learned from my FameLab experience. Uh, what is FameLab? FameLab is a, um, is a contest, it's a scientific contest. It's also known as the Science X Factor to find the new voices of the science. It has been organized firstly from uh, United Kingdom, uh, but now has been diffused all around the world uh, and uh, Almost of uh, all uh, European countries organize a FameLab competition, but also some extra European countries, such as Morocco, Tunisia, uh, USA, uh, Brazil, Brazil, South Africa, South Korea, China, and uh, Australia. What are the rules of the FameLab competition? Each competitor has three minutes to present a science or an engineering topic. In these three minutes, cannot use PowerPoint slides, but, uh, and cannot use uh, scenography. There is only the speaker, the audience, and the stage. And, but can use uh, a small object, uh, object which uh, can be contained in a pocket. So this is a brief communication uh, format, which can be useful to export for scientific dissemination in general, because it has many advantages. First of all, uh, we have a larger probability to obtain the audience attention during the world talk. If you say someone, would you like to, uh, to attend a one hour lesson of planetary formation? No, no, no. And three minutes lesson, <laughs> it can be possible. It is useful also for the speaker to, uh, to have a so limited time, it helps to uh, understand to the speaker which is very important to disseminate and which is less important. So it is a good opportunity for the speaker too. And is indicated for web dissemination, video sharing websites such as YouTube, Dailymotion, and because on these sites, on these sites, uh, uh, short videos are are more clicked than longer ones. There are many difficulties, a and the first, obviously, is little time available, and uh, for this reason, the speaker has to uh, know very well the topic, which is going to uh, explain. Uh, because it has, uh, he has to be able to discern what is really important. And uh, so uh, it's strange, but is uh, uh, more required an accurate knowledge of the argument uh, for shorter talks than for longer ones. And then uh, it is as general rule, uh, the speaker should be able to uh, answer to possible doubts or questions for the audience. And this is not uh, um, excluded that uh, uh, the audience uh, can be distracted. So many communication skills should be uh, adopted. For example, the language. We should avoid technicism. I will not say uh, the surface of Mars is primarily composed of theolitic basalt. Although parts are more silica rich than typical basalt and may be similar to andesitic rocks on Earth or silica glass. This is difficult to understand also who, for a specialist who study planetary atmosphere. So it is a not good way to approach the public. So no technician word, no dates, no name. They are, um, they are easy to understand, but difficult to be remembered. Um, if I say Uranus was discovered in 1781 by Herschel, whereas Neptune was discovered in 1846 by Leverrier, okay, the spectator understand that, but after 10 minutes from the end of the talk, you ask, uh, you ask him, who discovered Uranus? I, I don't think he remembered the name. For the, same num uh, for the same reason, no numbers. They are not intuitive. I would not say the series diameter is 950 kilometers. The spectator does not understand what does it mean, uh, these numbers. It's better to say the series diameter is one-tenth the uh, air terrestrial diameter, for example. Culture. Another communication technique. The speaker should enter into the uh, social and cultural background of uh, his public. So uh, it uh, uh, helps to draw, to capture attention. For example, is I, if I'm talking to a generic public, I will say the Venus temperature is similar to that of a pizza oven. And uh, everyone knows what is a pizza oven, so it could work. If I talk to children, I will say the terrestrial planets are full and have different sites, like Teletubbies. 
and uh, this is a very famous cartoon among children. So this is a, can be a good way to approach a childish public. If I talk to teenagers which listen to music, I will say, as Lady Gaga, a comet appears different every time we observe it. So <clears throat> we enter into the teenager world. Performance, it is useful uh, uh, to adopt some uh, theater technique to capture attention. Um, for example, in this uh, room there, are, there is who is uh, uh, looking at uh, their laptop, but if I, <laughs> if I change the volume of my voice, they rise up, they read. So uh, to change the, uh, the volume of the voice can uh, help to understand that uh, I'm saying something of important. Also, if I lower my tone of voice, what I'm saying, wow. Walk along this stage, you have a stage, use it. That stop that, uh, speaker can be boring. So it's better to use the world stage. Use all objects, they help to understand the uh, scientific concept explained. Images are not allowed uh, by FameLab, but uh, in uh, web dissemination, we are not performing a competition. If there are uh, useful uh, uh, images, use, um, use them. Jokes, humor, this is a, another technique. But all these techniques should be used with care because uh, uh, they should not overcome the scientific message. Uh, we are performing a scientific presentation and not a theater show. Okay, uh, let's see an example of a FameLab presentation. This is the, the presentation I, uh, I did at the, the Italian uh, final of FameLab. Uh, this is translated in English for, the, for this occasion. It concerns relation between Earth and asteroids, and the uh, scientific content is based on what has been published on these, um, these works, this paper published last year, the first one on science, the other one on uh, um, Icarus. So I, I will not use the microphone because I, I need the, the, the scene. So let's start. we have difficulties to uh, remember our childness and our youth, the same occurred on the Earth. In order to understand what happened in that two billion so of, uh, of years, we have to know, uh, we, have, we need a body which is now as the Earth was two billion of years ago. As to say, if I want to study a body which has uh, suffered a very strong evolution, Let's see 
our neighbors. Mass is too far from the sun. And water is in an iron pole. But Venus is too close to the sun. And water is in a uh, vacuum pole. Light can be open only at the right. Neither from a part, maybe with a part, neither with the other part, like Switzerland. Uh, water can be open only in a uh, water is a liquid pole. And asteroids, a primitive asteroid with an impact can have to uh, can uh, have left to the earth the light. In the future, another asteroid with another impact can bring it back. But this is an apocalyptic scenario and new age members will be happy to explain the same. Thank you. this session and I'm not going to be anything like that dynamic so <laughs> well done um, who's got questions anybody got any questions okay well thank you so much that was brilliant right um, our next two presentations are quite exciting because we have people from missions who are going to be talking about how the data from their missions can get out there to the public. So this is a very positive thing. And we have, first of all, B Bjorn Schreiner, um, who will be talking about uh, HRSC data. So are you up there or are you with a microphone? I'm afraid my show potential might not as big as the one from Andrea. And uh, yeah. <laughs> I'd exceed that quite well. Okay. So welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, my talk is about uh, an overview of techniques aims to the production of high quality PR imagery of HSC data. Um, so first, a little uh, overview of the camera. Probably everybody has seen these images already, but just to keep in mind, high resolution steer camera is on Mars Express now for 10 years and uh, has two actual cameras, HRC and HIC. This is uh, a high resolution uh, frame camera and this is a line scanning camera. Focal length 175 millimeters. Uh, important is we have uh, 10 meter per pixel resolution from 250 kilometer height with four sensors which looking in different directions and we have four sensors for color and we will use uh, the color and one of these uh, direction sensors for, for our imagery. Maximum resolution for this SSC, which I won't present here, is 2.3 meters and, well, wait, uh, roughly 20 kilogram. <coughs> Sorry for this being in German, but it's just to point out, it's an, kind of an explosion drawing, uh, the camera, optics, uh, filter plate, and here are the sensors located in the nine in total, uh, three by three lines. And these are the sensor lines, the actual ones where the data comes from. <coughs> uh, so if the, uh, yeah, the satellite flies over Mars during that, it takes up an image of the Mars in different directions and different colors at the same time. So uh, the ground track of, of each image is slightly different. We'll come to that later on. So four color channels, blue, green, red, infrared, and five photometric channels for the viewing angles. And it is, is used for uh, building up a digital terrain model. <coughs> this is maybe a bit technical. These are the filters of uh, uh, which are on the sensors. And we have the blue one, green one, red one, infrared one, and this is the, the nadir 
uh, channel we will also use. So that covers a bit of the red area, and the red of the red uh, channel is a bit more to the infrared than we would see. So there needs to be some some correction for that to to give uh, uh, colorful images. <coughs> uh, takes a while. Okay. Uh, Max Space is on an elliptical orbit, so it, it reaches here a closest point and goes away from Mars. And during that phase here, images are taken. So from north, south direction, all the images are uh, arranged like that. And um, this is a, well, looks a bit crude. You can't really see a lot. This is Valles Marinés somewhere here. Oh, sorry. And um, uh, Hellas Basin is around here. But that illustrates how the orbits are, are located uh, from, from north to south. And we want to try to make mosaics out of some, some areas. So to stick different orbits together, which come from different times, different seasons, different time of the day. So that makes some interesting effects. Well, requirements for a PR product are an interesting feature, which has to be, we need sufficient image quality in terms of brightness range, uh, constant gain, and no low noise. No is best, but low noise. Of course, every, everywhere is noise. Um, and we need detailed, sorry, detailed uh, and dynamic images as a, as a result from our processing. We need color variation because it's a stereo color camera. We, need, uh, we would like to have topography to show, also because it's a stereo camera, it shows uh, the, the terrain and uh, a story to tell. So these are the techniques needed for PR product uh, image data inspection, that is that every time new uh, data comes in, we need to, to review the data, see what's on it, uh, how is the quality, which interesting parts are on it, which is worth making a product from. Uh, then uh, histogram modification, it's on the actual images, so we stretch, stretch the, the, the gray values in a, in a global sense, so over the entire orbit, or on a local sense in, in small parts of it to adjust it. Uh, then another technique is HSI transformation. That is uh, putting a uh, red, green, blue image into a hue saturation intensity space, which allows us to, to, uh, to put into uh, relatively low resolution color information, high resolution uh, black and white information to combine this, merge these two. And alternatively, high pass filtering of uh, this Nadia channel. I will later explain. Um, then image sharpening. We want to have a crispy image and with a lot of detail. So this is done by, by unsharp masking with uh, varying ready. After that, we have the basis of 3D rendering. We need, therefore, a color image. And we need a DTM, a digital terrain model. So we can uh, adjust view and we can fly through an, an area and uh, mosaicing of the different orbits. You can make an, a release from, from one single orbit if your feature is only in one orbit, but sometimes it covers two orbits and then you need to merge the two orbits. <coughs> so technically for high quality product is a careful application of these techniques and the tools used are Photoshop Lightwave and some programming in IDL. Image flow is from here to there, the complexity uh, increases. We have level two as kind of a technical terms, uh, as a processing stages of, of the data where uh, there's no, it's only a projection, but not an auto uh, photo generation. Uh, we, we take an anaglyph from that, so it's like a view directly from top down to the surface with two eyes and what the two eyes would see virtually from the camera. <coughs> and uh, the next processing step is the, the auto, auto image, uh, Nadir, auto color 
DTM creation from these direction angles. They together come to a color uh, DTM, which is a high resolution image on top of a uh, color coded height map. So the heights are coded in colors. <clears throat> and uh, not to forget the auto color plus the nadir merge together to a high resolution color. As I said, color is low resolution, nadir is high resolution, but you need to put them together somehow. And altogether you can uh, color mosaic, also DTM mosaic, and finally mosaic plus color results in a possibility of making 3D scenes for stills or movies. Here are little examples of all these stages. Uh, a side branch here is making a context map from MOLA. It's, uh, uh, it's an American, it's a laser altimeter data from uh, Mars and uh, maps are derived from that. So for example of mosaicing especially is uh, now I take Rabe Krater, the orbits 2441 and 12736. They are a bit apart, about uh, eight years apart. So what first is from December 5, and uh, the second orbit is from December 14, uh, January, January 14, sorry. And we see, here's a map of Mars, Hellas Basin, Argyre Basin, Olympus Mons over here, Valles Marineris, and this is the Rabe Krater around here. So next to the Hellas Basin, this location of the orbits, we have one orbit here, this is the 12736. We call it as the, uh, the right orbit after, and this is the left orbit <laughs> to make it simpler. It's orbit 2441. So they are overlap over here, and this is our feature we want to have, the Rabe Krater. <coughs> the color channels, red, green, blue, they look slightly different, therefore we get color color uh, range out of that, and the nadir channel is the high resolution, in contrary to these, which are low resolution. <coughs> now we stack these together, red, green, and blue, and get something like that with ugly red edges we want to get rid of. And this is because of, of the viewing geometry, one channel looks to the forward, one to the backward, and if you go over an area, they cover slightly different areas. <coughs> so this is uh, a bit annoying, and for mosaicing we don't need that. And the, the practice is to cut out the, well, there's a bit uh, red channel, select black area, and fill this area in green and blue channels with black, and do this all with every channel, and fill the others uh, uh, with black. So we have nine operations for orbit, and that requires for automation. We do that in IDL, little procedure has been written. If you have two orbits, that's not no problem, but if you have 30 or 40 or 50 orbits, then that's a lot of time you can save with that. <coughs> so here we have um, orbits, uh, we have we've put the color, and we have cut away that by the procedure, and now add the second orbit, that's 12, 7, 3, 6, red, green, blue, red, green, blue, to make a composite. Now we have the two kind of in a raw form. The colors are assembled and we have also little edges here with the next, we get them away. We compare here with edges, no edges. And this is now ready for mosaicing. And we have a, in this crater, there's a dune field inside, a quite dark one, and uh, we see Orbits overlap, but the dune field is entirely in orbit 2441, so we would like to keep that as, a, as an entire form. And uh, we'll layer this orbit over that one and cut later out, lay later on this part out of it. <coughs> so that's the layering now. So they fit very well because uh, of bundle block, uh, bundle block adjustment. We, we do it FUB. And, uh, but we have color and brightness differences we have to get rid of. This is not in mosaic yet. And uh, so we adjust the histogram for each color. It's now for, for this one especially. And we will see 
Aha, now it's turning mass-like color. If we do the stretching over here, and uh, well, it looks okay, but if you see it on the screen, it's too, too much color. It's, it's really poppy. So we have to reduce the color a bit. Uh, that's saturation reduction, looks like that. Uh, next step is we uh, have a poor contrast around here because this is so dark and this will draw everything down. We apply the contrast and this is drowned, so you can't see any detail anymore of that part. So what we have to do is to, to mask out the dunes and accept these from this uh, operation we did before. What comes out, it is nicely stretched with good contrast and we still see the dunes. <coughs> so overall contrast is fine now. A uh, similar procedure with a second orbit. We adjust the colors like here. So we say starting endpoint of the histogram for each color. Uh, we see that the colors are now comparable, but our local differences here, for instance, is a bit it's brighter. Here is a bit more bluish. Here it's darker. So it varies over this entire thing. So it's, it's very hard to make this automatically. <coughs> And uh, we, we try to, uh, to compensate for that by a manual darkening and brightening with a varying tool ready. <coughs> um, so now we blended, we, we did this uh, correction and blended the two uh, in each other. So the former line was somewhere here, but you really can't see anymore. Here is a bit, uh, it's a rough area which comes from different illuminations. So the one looks a bit different than the other, but this is not color wise, it's uh, brightness wise. But the mosaic is done with that. Now, but I will do that quicker. Um, this is the NADIA channel, same procedure. We have to adjust uh, the first uh, orbit, the second one, and uh, after these procedures and unsharp masking, where we try to, to emphasize uh, contrast and uh, sharpness, sharpening with different radii, we have to marriage these two together. So this one on that one. And that's done by uh, lowest color with high Nadi mosaic, and they come by to a, uh, a color mosaic. It's done by HIS. Uh, I transform, I said before. So you put in, you substitute the intensity uh, with a uh, Nadia image, which is a bit histogram modified. So you put that data from high resolution into a low resolution image. Alternatively, you uh, can use a high pass filtered Nadia image on top of uh, the color one. So the result of that, we have first kind of blurry Titan, maybe like color, which is not really mass like, uh, with adjusted color. And in this detail, you see the dunes are very nicely shaped, in contrary to here, where it's a bit uh, muddy. And uh, yeah. So, uh, color and height information. This is DTM, the DHL terrain model. And this terrain model gets. Uh, color, so the black and white values or the height values get a color. Merged together with a Nadia mosaic will uh, give that one. And that is kind of a height map with high resolution visible height scale. Uh, the same with anaglyph. Anaglyph is the uh, two of the direction angles which allow a, a real view on the surface. <coughs> Merging together two orbits the same as before. It's tilted because of the flight direction. And for the eye viewing, you need uh, this orientation. Otherwise, you won't get the 3D effect. This is um, the, the Nadia channel. And this is the steerer channel. So if you jump this around a bit, you will see that slightly geometrically different. That's from the different viewing directions. Put together in a color image, but unfortunately, you need a color uh, glasses for that. You get in every pharmacy, meanwhile, I think. Uh, you would see it, well, the crater going down and the edge coming up and 
this is the effect, but only visible with glasses. <coughs> now we render this color image to a DTM. This is uh, uh, another scene, but just to explain in Lightwave, we do that color on TTM. This is the color image. This is a digital terrain model, shaded. This is the virtual camera. Put on that, so it's merged together here, the camera here, and we can steer around this uh, scene and uh, produce uh, virtual 3D views from that and make a movie while putting a track through that and uh, rendering every image. <coughs> a result from the, from the 3D modeling, it's uh, again the Rabe crater. You notice you see the dune field getting down here in this uh, uh, lower area. Another side from another direction from northwest scene. This one is from the west scene, slightly tilted, nicely detailed, color available. Uh, this maybe I skip. This is kind of getting rid of periodic noise uh, from Olympus. We have stripes here and no stripes here anymore after FFT filtering. And now the challenges diverging orbits. If you have uh, different illumination, totally different, illumination. one comes from the left, the other time comes from the right, then uh, you have a problem, you have to deal with that. Seasonal differences, clouds, image gaps caused by missing orbits, we have to, to fill them by interpolation, image gaps within orbit uh, by data loss, gain changes within orbit, clipping colors, heavy image compression by block artifacts, periodic noise, poor image range, orbit uh, ordering in layers, how, which orbit you take and how you layer it for making a mosaic and uh, yeah, make the right choice or reject ones. Here's some last uh, images of a successful uh, uh, mosaicing. This was the situation before, 36 HSC orbits. And this is how it came out afterwards. I think that's okay. Uh, we have also a movie of that. That is the version with the colored uh, terrain model on it on top. Another scene here from Dao and Miga Valleys. We have, uh, I think, se yeah, seven orbits in Roar. This is uh, the procedure how to make it equal. Also movie available. And uh, the color version of the terrain model. Here are our websites. You feel welcome to visit us. Thank you. Um, it's amazing to see the amount of care and attention that goes into these images that um, I'm certainly guilty of just kind of taking off the internet and adding to a press release. So, I mean, it's fascinating stuff. Um, quickly, one question. Yeah, are, are all these images available and do we have on, on the website yeah. and do we have uh, relative position of the sun and the spacecraft and, and Mars? Not specifically. Uh, the images are available, but uh, these parameters are usually, we, it's resolution we tell and uh, position, but the illumination conditions are not so much. Okay, thank you. Right, um, our next speaker, um, we're you. moving from the moon to, uh, sorry, from Mars to the moon, I think. Um, and our next speaker is, sorry, I've put my, um, um, is sorry. What's your first name? Miguel, Miguel Almeida. Um, who is um, who has been working on images from the um, Amy instrument um, from Smart One, which um, Bernard <laughs> um, talked to us a little bit about this morning. Um, so. Okay. Without so, further ado. Yep. So okay. So this uh, this is uh, a work that is done uh, between the Isaac, Isaac uh, faculty in uh, in Madrid and uh, and actually a group here from uh, from Lisbon uh, from Muninova just on the other side of the of the river. And uh, it's basically our objective is to, was to do a moon atlas with all the the data from the from the smart one Amy camera. And just a refresher for people to remember what was a smart one. 
Smart One was the first uh, lunar orbiter from uh, the European Space Agency. It orbited the moon from uh, uh, November 2004 to September 2006. And the ME imager took uh, 32,000 images. Uh, the orbit was uh, highly elliptical with a 300 kilometer uh, Paris center on the South Pole. And uh, so that's the South area. And you will see during the presentation is where we get uh, better resolution. And all the data is available in the, is publicly available in the Planetary Science Archive. So basically anyone could have done this. Uh, this is just to see the instruments that were on, the, on board of the spacecraft. But of course, I'm going to focus on the, on the Amy imager. So, um, I'll speak a bit about uh, what we did for the processing because there were some uh, challenges, and uh, start with uh, with the uh, what uh, uh, describing a bit the, the camera. So we had the, the AMI camera was a very small camera because because the the buzz the spacecraft was also very small with uh, a set of filters on uh, on top of it. Uh, the idea for these filters is that we could get uh, by uh, correctly timing the images, uh, we could get uh, the same location with the uh, different uh, bands. Uh, but uh, but the atlas is, I will not speak about that. But uh, And uh, then there was um, an area that was non-filtered. You can see by the bandwidth that uh, the exposure that is that was necessary for the different regions was uh, very different. And this is one of the challenges that we had, that uh, the filtered area as a much, uh, uh, the non-filtered area could allow much more light to come in. So uh, we had different exposures for, for the different areas. Then uh, we basically can see, uh, so we also the objective of this uh, moon atlas is that the data that we wanted to make available was as close to what was acquired as possible. But of course, we applied the normal uh, correction techniques, uh, and uh, so like in the with the dark correction, and for the dark correction we had to use uh, data from the actually data from uh, star fields uh, average for the complete mission because uh, smart smart one was a long time in the radiation belts uh, that degraded a bit the the camera, so we could not use the calibration that was done uh, on the ground. And uh, basically, you can see here what happens during, uh, when the image is dark corrected, that uh, the area non-filtered is much more, uh, it's much brighter than the area under the, the filter. Then uh, we did the same for flat fielding, because we could not use the flat fields acquired uh, on the Earth. We averaged uh, all the images when, where, where there was homogeneous uh, illumination. And, uh, and basically, you can see here the, the result of, uh, of the flat fielding. Then additionally to, to, the, to this uh, issue of uh, how to calibrate the data with uh, because we could not use the, the data for the calibration from ground, we had uh, there's, there was a scattered light uh, below the, the filters. This we didn't uh, solve, but you can see here that uh, uh, on the image on the left, uh, the, the part under the filter is brighter, and the, on the image on the right, uh, it's, uh, so it was, uh, it's, its uh, brightness is less than the, the average. Okay, and here it's uh, basically a, another example. This is a already completely calibrated uh, image that you can see some effect of the, of the scattered light. Okay, so after that we had the data ready to be to be treated, uh, and uh, so we had to basically classify it, look, uh, find out what we had, and uh, so as I said, uh, high resolution was in the South Pole. So here you can see what coverage uh, we had with all the images and the resolutions. Uh, this is basically with this uh, we took the next step that was to how to lay out the map because uh, the resolution was higher on the on the south pole we had we did ma uh, we plan to have more maps on the south and ma and less maps in the in the north 
and uh, so also all the maps should be done in a way that we could just put them all together and uh, have a larger map. So here you can see the, um, what was the layout for the lower um, latitudes. So you can see here that in the, in the northern part, uh, there's only eight uh, squares. And this, in the south part, we have uh, 12. Then um, for the, to the same thing happened uh, for the northern hemisphere and uh, the southern hemisphere. So in the northern hemisphere, we have many less uh, uh, divisions than, the, than in the, the southern hemisphere. Again, for, this, for the same uh, reason. And uh, in the end, so this is basically just the, the total number of maps. And you can see that on this is the average uh, resolution for the South Pole. We got, uh, we got to an average of 85 meters at, uh, with the best of around 35. And in the North Polar region uh, with 300 meters per pixel uh, resolution. OK, then the, this, the interesting part of this is that uh, the data was uh, uh, the metadata that we got from the images was uh, very precise. So we could do the, all the mosaicing without, uh, without uh, any. So basically, we got just with the knowing where the image was supposed to be projected, we could put it in the, in the map. So, so we, we started by projecting all the data automatically uh, in, the, in the map. Then uh, we realized that there were some, uh, some images that were not uh, perfect. So there were some uh, issues. So we had to do some manual uh, uh, select, uh, prioritization uh, scheme uh, just to, so that the better images would, uh, would appear in the map. And, uh, after that uh, uh, manual prioritization was set up, we could uh, basically <coughs> do everything uh, automatic. So you can see here the, uh, what was the result. So this is uh, with just uh, picking up the data directly and put it in the map. And you can see here that there were some uh, issues that uh, there were parts of images that were not uh, showing. And then uh, when we did the prioritization, it just showed uh, immediately like this and again, the, from the image to map, is, was, uh, it, everything is, uh, is automatic. Then uh, the last uh, processing step is that, uh, of course, we had, uh, because of the different uh, angles of the, the sun, the, um, the brightness uh, scale was, uh, was different. And we just used uh, the APCA correction uh, that uh, just accounts for the, well, with the with the typical parameters, but basically the the important one is that is the where is the sun uh, as seen from the from the from the target. <clears throat> and here you can see again uh, the brightness uh, scaling just directly and uh, using a uh, APCA. Then um, so. So the only thing that was left in the end, so here you see that uh, the map was uh, quite homogeneous uh, regarding brightness. But one thing that is a feature and it is not um, that we didn't try to correct because it, it was part of showing what uh, actually happens when we are acquiring the data is that uh, depending on the, on the season, the, there's going to be shades and uh, so here in this part, you can see that the sun was basically from, uh, from above and uh, there's no shadows. And in this part, uh, we, we see shadow effects. Our selection criteria is to get the, it was to get the best data and we didn't want to, to do any correction in the, to try to get uh, an homogeneous uh, map. Okay, then... Uh, this is just uh, again to lower latitudes, and this is the the full map uh, that we got. And uh, so you can see that it's basically like uh, I showed in the beginning with the with the coverage. And uh, then we go for um, for some examples. So you can see here if, uh, this is map uh, 16, and uh, that we can zoom in into into areas and uh, we. 
that we can, that uh, you can see here basically the images, uh, the different images selected, and uh, that there was basically no additional uh, processing put. It was as the image was there. It, it's in the it's in the map. So the same for the for the North Pole. That uh, so this is the 300 meter per pixel uh, resolution. And uh, the South Pole. That this is this was one of the most difficult areas to produce because of the large shadows that all the data had. So, but uh, then you can uh, you, we can also zoom in and see that uh, because the resolution was. Uh, well, was really good so that we can see uh, really very detailed uh, uh, features like uh, well, all types of craters and uh, even uh, lava tubes. Okay, here, even better resolution. Um, so yeah, so basically we have all the all the data is. Um, is, is there uh, and uh, we plan to well we want to do it as a as a book and uh, publish it on the on the web and uh, provide the software that we use as a as free software thank you it's really fascinating to see um, two different instruments and two different approaches to to putting together these images, both equally fascinating. Does anybody have any questions for Miguel? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think hopefully all these images, are also as the material that we have already available uh, online, can be used by you all uh, in your scientific project, in your education project. So don't hesitate uh, to use them and uh, um, have exercise, uh, hands on exercise making use of all our data. Thank you. Um, can I just make sure, thank you again, Miguel. Um, can, can I just make sure, I, I don't think that Zdenek Urban is here. Um, nobody's giving his presentation on his behalf, are they? No, okay, right. So um, I'm afraid you're stuck with me now for the last session before lunch. Right, um, so uh, my name is Anita Heward. Um, I am here to talk about um, outreach related to Europlanet. Um, now, I hope that most of you will have seen the Europlanet new and beautiful logo that we have um, out around the site. Um, but while some of you in this room have been quite intimately involved in the project since the beginning and obviously know all about it, um, I think there are also some people who probably haven't really heard about it. So I thought it might be useful before we get into what we're doing outreach-wise um, currently, in the past, and in the future, we hope, with Europlanet, it might be worth just going through what exactly Europlanet is, why it's there, what it's for. Um, so essentially, Europan is there to overcome the fragmentation of the European planetary science community because we have probably one of the largest communities, probably the largest community of planetary scientists in the world. Um, we have about 800 tenured scientists. We probably have somewhere between three and five times that number of early career researchers and PhD students. Um, we have all kinds of industry and SMEs that actually we haven't really engaged with yet, so we're not quite sure how many there are out there. There's a couple of really large companies like um, Astrium or Airbus, as it now is, um, and Tala Selenia, but there's all kinds of little companies as well that make instrumentation or data models or data products um, that, that we don't really know about. And then, of course, there's you guys. There's the, the outreach and education community. Um, 
but all of these people are spread across probably something like 27 countries with many different languages. Even within those countries, there are many different languages and cultures and dialects. So it's um, a very disparate and diffuse community. Um, and the other thing is that unlike um, in the States or in Japan, um, our space agency, the European Space Agency, is only responsible uh, for building and operating the mission. So the science that goes with that mission um, is funded by, at a national level by all those different countries. Um, and so this is where Europlanet comes in. The, it comes in to provide the coordination and the coherence and to organize meetings like the European Planetary Science Congress, where all of those uh, scientists can get together um, and share ideas, uh, discuss science goals for the future, um, and can potentially um, find ways of sharing facilities and data and setting up virtual observatories and other tools to make European planetary science um, the best that it possibly can be. Um, so Europlanet began out of a collaboration of the scientists involved in the Cassini-Huygens mission um, to Saturn, and I think the idea was first mooted in 2002. Um, Jean-Pierre, I think, was part of that founding team, um, and they put together a proposal uh, to the European Commission under FP6, and that was successful. And they were given two million euros um, for four years from 2005 to 2008 to do networking, which was really the first step in building that community. So identifying who that community is, who that, who that wider community is of planetary scientists, um, and getting them to know each other and one of the big successes was setting up this conference, the European Planetary Science Congress, um, which is now self-sustaining and with or without Europlanet um, will carry on into the future. Although it is still very much the child of Europlanet. Um, and then we had a sef second grant from the European Commission from 2009 to 2012. Um, which was a research infrastructure. Um, so beyond the networking activities, which still carried on, um, there were formal ways that scientists in one country could go to a different country to use laboratory facilities. Um, we had people going out to field sites um, in um, Tunisia and in Spain to find places on Earth that were like Mars um, to test experiments and to look at how life might have um, evolved. Um, so that's kind of the history, and this is this is pictorially what Europlanet does. Um, it does some lab stuff. It does meetings. It does field sites. We have um, this, we have a lovely group of women, hurrah, um, out in Svalbard um, testing instrumentation um, on in a scenario which might be analogous to Europa. Um, we work with space-based missions, also ground-based missions. And increasingly with the amateur community, um, using their expertise, um, instrumentation and data, um, and we have meetings. And the science that we get out of that comes from planetary missions from all of these different places. And the things that really are kind of, from the way that I see it from the communications point of view, are the unique, unique selling points, should we say, of, of Europlanet are that because we have this broad range of data, um, there's a lot of comparative planetology, looking at how different planetary bodies, what we can learn about different planetary bodies by looking um, at them in the context of other ones. Um, and this, this sense of going to places on Earth um, where you can actually get out there, you can have people who are analogous explorers, um, testing instruments um, and actually digging down examining rocks, seeing things, um, and actually physically exploring our solar system. So currently, we're in a bit of a hiatus. Um, the FP7 funding finished in December 2012, but Europlanet has carried on. That, that sense of community built over this eight-year period um, has carried on, and we now have this member um, organization. We have 60 institutions spread across Europe who, are, who have signed up. We're expecting some more to, who, who are in the process of signing up, and we're expecting about 100 people, uh, not 100 people, 100 institutions um, to be formally part of Europlanet by next year, um, and within the next five years, pretty much get most of those um, institutions um, involved in planetary science across Europe actually formally part of the Europlanet project. 
Um, the products um, created during FP7 have been maintained. Um, and the current things that Europlan has been doing is forming the steering committee for this meeting um, and also making sure that the planetary science community talks to each other and is really prepared for opportunities coming up through um, opportunities like that Horizon 2020 funding programs. But what you really want to know is outreach. Um, so from in our first phase, we, we had an outreach program. We were... Um, Outreach has been a core part of Europlanet right from the beginning, um, and in this first phase, 10% of the budget was allocated to outreach because the project really believed that outreach was an important thing to do. Um, and one of the first things that happened was that um, we established this kind of outreach stream of sessions during EPSC. Um, we also organised various other networking meetings, best practice sharing meetings um, at various locations around Europe. We set up our initial website, um, we created some videos, um, and we created some best practice guidelines that we, um, in collaboration with other projects, um, which we uh, would do with creating um, an outreach strategy for, um, for a mission. And then we ran some special events and projects. Um, 2007 fell in the middle of our, um, of our project, um, which was the anniversary, 50th anniversary of Sputnik. Um, and so we ran a competition, an art competition for that. Um, and we did all kinds of other experimental exhibitions and competitions. Um, we participated in Cassini Scientists for a Day, uh, Galileo Nights, and um, uh, an astronomy, gastronomy, exploring the different, uh, or exploring uh, overlaps and um, the possibilities for inspiring people to an interest in planetary science through food. Um, in the next phase of Europlanet, things got a bit more formal. Um, we, we had a very much more structured plan for what we were going to do, um, and it was kind of split up into various streams. So we set up a, a planetary media centre, which was um, my particular baby, um, which involved making sure that the science results um, from, from European scientists got out there, got that message out there to the media um, in different languages and different cultures. Um, and a lot of that activity is traditionally focused around EPSC. We ran an outreach funding scheme um, for just small amounts of, uh, of money, five to 10,000 euros, um, where people had an idea that they just kind of needed a bit of money just to get it going. Um, and we funded projects over the four years. We funded seven projects over the four years. Um, but actually, what was really good was that some of those projects, and you know, within the context, um, quite a lot of those projects, actually went on to have quite a big European um, impact. So we were very pleased about that. Um, we had a prize for public engagement because there are so many people, like all of you pretty much in this room, um, who, do fantastic, um, who do fantastic outreach work, who have you know, a lot that the science community should be very grateful for um, in getting the word out about what's going on and in inspiring our next generation of scientists and engineers. But as you probably find, or I, I hope not, but as is often the case, it's quite thankless work. Um, you don't necessarily get the support from institutions that you should do. You don't necessarily get the recognition um, that you do. So we thought we would have a prize to thank people um, and highlight the work that they do. Um, and so we have all awarded four of those prizes um, to all kinds of different people. Uh, Jean Lindenstein um, built a planetarella, a simulator for Aurora, um, which is now used in, um, the, there's now examples of that in many um, museums um, and science centres around Europe. Um, the Austrian Space Forum do fantastic educational work um, in Austria, not just in Innsbruck where they're based, but all over Austria, um, and are, are really pioneering, visionary kind of um, organisation. Yeah, Nase is an example of a researcher who um, has a very long track record in doing great outreach work, writing books, really championing the cause of getting girls interested in science and astronomy. And Jay Tate, completely different again, um, founder of the Space Guard um, um, Centre, which is there to um, raise, raise awareness of the threat from um, near-Earth objects um, and asteroid impacts. Um, so we had a prize. We had 14 national nodes who were there to kind of be the point of contact in these disparate regions of Europe um, and localise whatever information we could put out there um, and tell the Europlanet community what 
was needed by those different communities because it's very different. Um, we ran some science communication training workshops and perhaps we should get our FameLab colleague um, to participate in those in the future because um, that sounds a, a fantastic way of, um, of, of training people to communicate. Um, and we also did some policy engagement works, um, doing dinner ba debates and individual briefings um, in the European Parliament and with the European Commission to raise the awareness of planetary science and how that fits into European citizens' everyday lives and the political needs of our community. Um, so the reason for going into all this background um, is, th and the reason for giving this talk, is that Europlanet hopes it will have a bright and wonderful future. Um, we submitted a big proposal, which I think finally came in at 343 pages um, on the 2nd of September, kept a lot of people up at night. Um, it's for 10 million euros overall, um, which includes the research activities, um, the virtual observatory, um, all these field trips to planetary analogue sites that we've been talking about, um, as well as impact um, and engagement. We have 33 beneficiaries from 18 countries, um, plus 22 associate partners who are all kinds of different organisations including the European Science Foundation and Eurospace which is the trade association of, um, of uh, space companies so helping us identify this mysterious lot of space companies that we don't quite know about. Um, within our outreach bit we have eight partners um, and three associates and what we've done is we've taken the bits that really worked from FP7 and we'll build on those because having tried and tested them over four years then we um, are keen to go ahead with them, but then we are bringing in some new activities to reach more diverse audiences. Um, and so we have quite a broad range of audiences that we're trying to engage with, um, some of which are educators, some of which are students, some of which are general public and the media, but we also have these stakeholder audiences that we need to engage with as well, like policymakers and in industry. We're led by Science Office based here in Portugal, um, which is an SME um, of communication specialists, so it includes press officers and uh, graphic designers and social media experts. Um, and they will be giving us that professional guidance um, in taking our, our project forward. And we also have you know, a broad spread across Europe from, um, from Athens down in the southeast to the UK in the northwest and then um, Vilnius and uh, uh, Latvia in the north east down to Portugal here. So um, we, we kind of do a big crisscross right the way across Europe. Um, and this is probably a bit too complicated, but um, anyway, kind of shows that we have sort of three streams of things that we're trying to do, and we engage with Europlanet, which is up here, and then we engage with everybody else out there, so all our different audiences, and particularly the partner networks, um, because we know that we can't do every, we have no intention of trying to do everything ourselves. We know that there are brilliant people who do fantastic work already, and we want to work with them and engage with them um, and try to build links so that we can all work together to be as effective as possible. Um, so, in terms of outreach services and community support, um, we'll carry on organising meetings and training, um, communication training, um, meetings here specialist best practice meetings for different groups. Our node network didn't quite work because we had quite different people. So we had some people who were, who were, who were press people, we had some people who were educators, we had some people who were, um, uh, had very different ideas and needs. And so what we want to do is focus that on the different groups of people, like social media managers, get them together to find out what works, what doesn't work, how we can improve Europe's contribution in that. Um, evaluation is an incredibly important thing that um, is often one of those things that everybody says is a good idea but we don't know quite how to do. We have some money invested into trying to create some kind of evaluation toolkit that will be useful both to us um, and to our external community. Um, we're carrying on the prize and the funding scheme which uh, we've already discussed and we have a bit of money as well to translate things properly. So rather than just um, relying on the goodwill of people to translate bits and pieces here and there, we, have, uh, we will try to formally do that. Um, as I say, we've got a slightly more complicated range of people that we need to engage with including industry and policy but um, a lot of the same tools that we'll, do, uh, we'll, we'll use for both like Social media, LinkedIn is now a really good way of identifying people, engaging with people, letting people know what's happening. So 
um, will carry on with industry and policy activities. You might have noticed in our previous thing that social media wasn't mentioned at all. Um, social media kind of caught us by surprise when we um, um, wrote the proposal for the last round of Europlanets. It didn't, well, it, it did exist, but it wasn't the thing that it is now. So anyway, we have a big um, activity devoted to that now so that beyond our website, we actually properly um, use the platforms that are available. Um, and we will carry on using um, our media center and the distribution channels that we've built up there. Um, to reach um, media audiences um, across Europe. And then finally, we will be creating some outreach tools ourselves, which is kind of the first time that we've done this. Um, Science Office um, make these fantastic videos. Um, they have some really, really talented an uh, animators. Um, this is their um, science for science presented by children. I, I can't remember what the what the title is, but anyway, it, it is short educational videos to, that are presented by children. I don't think that we will have the children because it's just too complicated. But we will have these lovely animations, um, which make it easier to translate things from one language to another to talk about planetary science, um, both sort of the core topics and also new things that that come out during the project. Um, we'll be working with the Austrian Space Forum, who. Um, have developed some fantastic expertise in uh, linking up informal learning and school groups um, with uh, people working in uh, on field trips and doing things like um, testing out Mars spacesuits. Um, and we will also be de developing an Arduino-based project um, of climate monitors, which will um, allow students to collect data and then compare that to data from the um, REMS instrument, the weather instrument on Mars Curiosity and various other um, planetary weather data. Um, so that's basically it. We've got stuff that we've tried and tested. We've got new stuff that we're really excited about. Um, and if you want to find out more, then this is our website, um, which is still quite historical, but will be getting a complete we brand if and when uh, Europlanet gets funded in the future. But regardless of anything, Europlanet will carry on as a community forum and EPSC will certainly be here in perpetuity, we hope. So thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? Everybody is hungry. Right. Okay, off you go. <laughs> and thank you to all our other speakers.